and I started a family fairly late uh, so I didn't know now I can say it's the best thing that ever happened to me awesome um, so happiness point number one happiness point number two my friends how many kids have you got I've got two two kids eh? yeah Ach, lovely man. yeah I've yeah. got three it's amazing yeah it's amazing I'm suddenly life makes sense yeah you know what you're doing it for yeah <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. I am in Nice at the preservation meeting and Bart Stubinetsky has happened. joined us. Right. Yeah. Nailed it, bro. It's, it's an honor to be here, Cameron. Thank you so much, eh? Thank you for finally inviting me after like three years of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. No, no, listen. Yeah, okay, okay. But you're here now. It's fantastic. And and tomorrow, so if this goes well, then I can ask you easy questions in the live surgery when I'm moderating you on Saturday. Great. Yeah, I'll yeah. have earplugs in so I won't hear you anyway. Oh, no. So, Bart, tell the listeners who are you? Yeah, it's you have some time or not? We've got time. Okay. We've got half an hour. Okay. I was I was born in the States. Wow. Um and I grew up in Kenya, so close to where you're from. Wow. And then And until what age? I, I was in Kenya for primary school. Wow. Because they didn't have secondary school. Wow. So then for secondary school I moved to Luxembourg, which is richer than Switzerland actually. Uh <laughs> we've, we've got a listener in house <laughs> background there. <laughs> yeah. But this is amazing, eh? So, born in the States, growing up in Kenya, then going to Luxembourg. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And uh, I was, I never wanted to become a doctor because my mom really wanted me to become a doctor. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, her father, was a doctor who died in a concentration camp. No. Uh, so she never really knew him. And oh. so for her, it was really important that one of her sons yeah. would become a doctor. Um, and as medical school in the States is really expensive, yeah. I think back then it was $80,000 a year, uh, they decided to uh, make me Dutch. Um, so I could study in the Netherlands for a thousand dollars a year. How did they get that right? Uh, ancestry. Really? Yeah. So how did your parents move around like that? What were they busy doing? My, they were in, uh, in the States. My dad was in the States for his PhD. So okay. I brought my mom. Yeah. And uh, actually then he wanted to become a school teacher in Hawaii, which didn't work out. So he started working for the World Bank. Yeah. And with the World Bank, he traveled around. Okay. Yeah. And do you have siblings? I have one brother. Yeah. 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 Also a doctor. No, a banker, like wow. my father. Wow. Wow. I know you guys are quite close. We actually live now. We live five minutes apart. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We lived all over, but now we live five minutes apart in Amsterdam. Okay. So, so our journey, the discussion was now you're going to go and study medicine in Holland. Yes. Yes. And from there? Uh, from there, I went to the States again to do my PhD. And I actually decided I didn't want to become a doctor anymore. Uh, so I started working for a spin-off of McKinsey. Yes. As a consultant. consultant. Uh, I did that for a very short, brief moment. And then I decided that... What was your PhD in? In what? Uh, renal transplant. So <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> Francis is, is into heart transplants, you into renal transplants. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating, okay? And then you don't want to consult for McKinsey, so. No, no, so I, uh, I started surgical training and uh, at a certain point, uh, they approached me from the Department of Plastic Surgery and they said, you know, your research into, we were, we were into immunomodulation, mm -hmm. that was our research. Mm -hmm. They said, we're starting a program with face and hand transplant. Wouldn't you be interested in becoming a plastic surgeon so that your research could be used within the field of plastic surgery? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how I switched to plastic surgery. And uh, I ended up 
moving to Toronto uh, to become a craniomaxillofacial surgeon and cleft surgeon. Um, so that's when I started doing my first noses, but they were purely reconstructive. Yes. And that's how I approached my first aesthetic nose, is purely reconstructive. Um, and then it took, and, and actually the results weren't bad. So I'm, I'm absolutely uh, for what the surgeon likes best yeah. himself. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then in 2017, I met Barish. And Barish at the time was doing. When your life changed. Yeah, he was doing polygon tip yes. surgery. And that really changed the way that my tip started to look. It started to look so much better. And at that time, he was still doing Libra graft. I don't know if you've heard of yeah. Libra graft. Yeah. Um, and Libra grafts changed my dorsum because suddenly I had beautifully, beautiful dorsal lines, completely straight dorsums. So I thought, okay, I'm set for the rest of my life. Um, but then one year later, we met Saban in some obscure anatomy course in Barcelona. Yeah. And Barish was there and I was there and Barish was doing a variation of the high strip and Eve showed us the high strip. And that's when I started doing preservation rhinoplasty for the dorsum and polygon tip plasty for the tip. Amazing. Eh? Yeah. And what do you do nowadays? Uh, well, I thought I was, that was going to be it. Um, so and you then, in Toronto, is that when you were no, still no, no, there that, at the that, time? No, 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 I moved back to Amsterdam. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was working academically, actually, as a craniomaxillofacial surgeon. Um, and uh, I, was, I was having a, a bit of problems with the high strip, uh, which is very personal. Yeah. I, I couldn't get the nose, I couldn't get it always completely straight. And sometimes I would have a slightly broader dorsum than what I started off with. Uh, and then luckily the low strip came into my life uh, yeah. by, by my dear friend Valerio. Yes. Uh, so if you ask me, what do I do now? Um, fast forwarding, uh, I'm out of academia. I have my own private clinic. Yeah. Uh, I do 98% preservation rhinoplasty, uh, mostly low strip wow. uh, polygon tip. But that's a hugely high percentage compared to what the general rhinoplasty surgeon's doing, eh? Yeah, yeah. I do, I do high volume. I do more than 300 cases a year. Yeah. Um, and, of course, I'll, I'll put in structural, like I'll rasp the dorsum. Yeah. Um, and so then it will be cartilaginous preservation. Yeah. But uh, nowadays we have so many little tricks to yeah, absolutely. shape the bone and shape the cartilage before we do preservation yeah. um, to make them... Uh, yeah, to make them nice for preservation rhinoplasty. Yeah. Before it was, if the if the dorsal lines are not nice, then you should do structural. And uh, now you can adapt the dorsal lines and still do preservation. Shit. And I just, yeah, I just, it's just my thing. I really love it. I love the results. They look super natural. Um, so, yeah. But you, you can see it, like, I mean, obviously I follow you on Instagram and just see, it's your happy place, eh? You like... You love it. Yeah. So, so yeah. I'm going to come back to rhinoplasty. What do you do when you're not doing rhinoplasty? Uh, uh, well, uh, there, there are a couple of things, I think, that, that give people happiness in their life. Yeah. Um, first thing is family. Um, and I started a family fairly late. Uh, so I didn't know. Now I can say it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Awesome. Um, so happiness point number one. Happiness point number two, my friends. How many kids have you got? I've got two. Two kids. Yeah. Oh, lovely, man. Yeah. I've yeah. got three. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, Suddenly life makes sense. Yeah. You know what you're doing it for. Yeah. Um, number two. Number two is friends. Yes. I have uh, three really good friends. Yeah. Um, and those are the friends that will stick with me even when things yeah. are not good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think three is a lot. So yeah, I, don't, I, agree with you. I don't need any more. Yeah. Um, and number three is your passion. If you have a passion, if you're lucky to have a passion that makes you happy yeah. and that actually also helps other people, yeah. it's amazing. And I found that in rhinoplasty. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah uh, it, it makes me think of it, the, the whole concept of Japanese ikigai, where you have to like 
the, where the, it works perfectly, when you can marry things like where your passion, what you get paid for, um, what you enjoy, yeah. you know, in, in one thing. And yeah. that's actually your calling, you know. Yeah. That's yeah. And interesting. I'm, I'm really blessed that I found that. That's it. Um, so what did your wife do? Uh, something completely different. Yeah. She used to be a, a classical dancer. Wow. Um, and she is uh, really into uh, yoga and mindfulness. Oh, and, uh, wow. So it's, that has brought a whole new dimension to my life, um, which actually uh, benefits my practice. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in a very strict routine. Well, people call it strict. I, I call it lovely. I get up at 5 in the morning. Um, I meditate. Uh, I work out, I take a cold plunge, uh, I do intermittent fasting, so I don't eat until 12. We do uh, three noses, we're done at 2.30. I go home and I spend time with my kids, so it's, yeah, it's good. So where does the consultations fit in? They don't, no, they do, they do. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'll, I'll work four days a week, and one week I'll do three days of surgery, one day of consults, and the other week I'll do two days of surgery and two days of consults. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think the most important thing is communication with the patient. Yeah. And we're very approachable. Uh, so, I'm coming back to this physically. So, working out, because if you're doing three rhinoplasties a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, by Thursday you're knackered, eh? It's physical work, concentrating and having to get your core working yeah. whilst you're operating. Yeah, yeah. But uh, again, uh, for me, the days of surgery are my are my favorite days. Yeah. Um, I work out a lot. I do a lot of hit training and a lot of running to to stabilize my core. Yeah. Um, so I really don't have any issues while doing surgery. Uh, I have always the same surgical nurse yeah, um, who, will, who, yeah. who will be here uh, yeah. when I do live surgery. Fantastic. Um, so that makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't find the surgery days that stressful. I find clinic days more stressful, Yeah. actually. Uh, of the patients who walk into your door, how many of them end up getting a rhinoplasty? So we do, we do a screening before they're allowed to walk into the door. Okay. So they have to send an application form with pictures. And based on uh, that, we already screen. So, we okay, already so of that, how many would end up actually first coming to your door? You probably say? about 70, 80%. Okay. So we filter out the ones that okay. we're like, no. And um, then I actually... They get 20 minutes with me and 20 minutes with, uh, with my consultant. Um, I probably know within the first 30 seconds if I'm going to do surgery on them or not. And it's something that you, I think that you cultivate. It's, it's your inner voice. There we go. And okay. uh, it's, I think it's the best lesson I ever uh, learned from, uh, from my, one of my mentors, John Phillips in, uh, in Toronto. And uh, while we were doing maxilla uh, jaw surgery or cranial uh, cranial reconstruction yeah. you say always listen to your inner voice because yes. if your inner voice says that something's wrong something is wrong yes so never ever neglect your inner voice and uh, yeah of course sometimes you do and then you realize that you shouldn't so yeah. coming back to your exercise regime surely you do a bit of endurance work as well I think I've seen photographs of you on a bicycle yeah yeah you can't uh, just do being hit. No, 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 I don't. I, uh, but, but with kids, you have a bit less time to train. I yeah. used to do uh, <laughs> triathlons, yeah, yeah. Ironmans. Oh, really? Uh, yeah? I did ultra marathons wow. in, in the desert. Yeah. Uh, I do biking. Is the desert one the stay, the one in Morocco? Yeah. Have you done that? Yeah. Yeah. Man, maximum respect. I've got an ultra trial coming up in the end of uh, April in South Africa. Yeah, but you're kind of a national hero in oh, South no, Africa. No, no, no. Yeah, Olympic. No one thinks about that when you're in the mountain, eh? No, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So, so because you, you, I mean, you and Baris and Valero, you guys go on this little cycle around. Yeah, we yeah. do. We do. We started, uh, we started it in the Netherlands yeah. uh, two years ago. Yeah. Um, and it was... 
it was biking and at night someone would give a presentation about rhinoplasty and then we mm. would drink wine and eat good food. Um, and last year Ruben uh, from Barcelona organized it in Spain uh, and this year it will be in Sicily. So uh, it's, yeah, it's special. It's a, okay, but I mean, it, it, it's absolutely abundantly clear as chatting how inspiring you are, but my question is if somebody wants to come and visit you, is it, do you allow fellows to come and learn from you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I And do. How, how do they go about doing something like that? Um, they'll, most of them write me an email mm -hmm. um, and uh, then they uh, get placed on the waiting list uh, because I, I don't want to do surgery every day with people around me. Mm. So we, uh, we allow for two, two a month. Mm -hmm. um, so the waiting list is fairly long. So you say two a month. How do, are they there for a period? How, how long a period of time would they be with you? Probably two, two days. Yeah, three days. No, because it's true. You 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 kind of lose concentration on what you want to do whilst you're trying to teach somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's 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 yeah. Also the time factor, you know, because you know we have a busy life and. Uh, I love explaining it to people, but there, there it also is. I have to have a click with the person who wants to come. Mm. Mm. Because if someone's there that you don't have a click with, it, the day becomes very long. So, uh, mostly... <laughs> the day becomes very long. So, I mostly I want, to, I, I, I want to meet the people first that come. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. 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 But again, I mean, I've, I've learned from the giants, uh, Saban and Barish and Valerio. And yeah. the guy who taught me uh, rhinoplasties in Toronto was uh, Chris Forrest. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, I'm absolutely open to teaching people That's what cool. I know. You know, but sometimes I do these interviews and I kind of don't know what to ask next. And um, it's just fascinating to hear your story. It's really, it really, honestly, it's just great to hear that. I'm, I'm glad that there's another African around. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually, that's, that's another passion I didn't talk about, Operation Smile. Yeah, I yeah. work for Operation Smile. We do cleft surgery. Okay. And this year, uh, I've, been going, I've been going to Kenya and Ethiopia a lot. I've gone to Madagascar a couple of years. Yeah. Um, this year, I'm going to Madagascar again. Wow. And uh, my big friend David Chong will be there. Um, but I'm bringing my family. And my kids are going to... How old are your kids now? 10 and 11. Oh, really? And uh, they're going to work for an organization that feeds malnourished children. Oh, your uh, kids are going to help as well. Yeah, yeah, they're going to work th there. It is so essential to teach them that stuff. That's yeah. great, eh? Yeah, just to show them that life is more than Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah. Um, Have they been on a safari yet? No. No. That has to happen, eh? That's then the next step, huh? Bring them to South Africa. <laughs> No, so I'm really excited about that. Yeah, I, I remember she's my, I was in Canada 32 years ago on a school exchange, Toronto. That was 1992. I think those Canadians corrupted me a little bit, eh? Yeah. They're, they're good people. No, they're lovely, eh? Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm, I'm pulling your leg, eh? No, no, no. I mean, I've, uh, I think I learned more the three years I was in Toronto than uh, during my whole residency. Okay, last question I have. Are you completely in your own private practice? Because I think there's something unique about the rhinoplasty surgeons that we like a family. We really, it it's transcends the kind of normal specialist, like mine's bigger than yours kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, how, how's the work in Amsterdam amongst your colleagues, if I can kind of maybe ask a question as directly as that? Yeah. Um... It's, it's actually, it's, uh, it's like being the one-eyed person in the land of the blind. Yeah. Um, there are not a lot of plastic surgeons who do rhinoplasty. And from the ones who do, there are nearly none that do preservation. Yeah. Mm, there are a few ENT surgeons who are actually really good. Yeah. Um, Dr. Menger, for example, is really good. He does structural, mm -hmm. uh, but he's really good at doing a structural. Yeah. Uh, there are a few ENT surgeons who do preservation who are really good, but uh, it's not as crowded as, for example, uh, Istanbul. Yes. So yeah. Um, it's, uh, yeah, we get along fairly well. It's great. Eh? But my biggest family is... Uh, 
rhinoplasty surgeons outside of the Netherlands. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Guys, if you're listening to this podcast, wherever in the world you are, Bart's probably been to your country. Because <laughs> it's listened everywhere. And you want to learn, make an effort to come here next year. And then at the same time, if you're going to come all the way to Europe, go and visit these guys. They, that's how I learned. I mean, 10 years ago, I started just knocking on doors, reading, seeing who the authors of the main chapters in the books were, and just blindly saying, I want to come and learn. Yeah. And it's, you can learn so much. I'm very excited to be in theatre with you on Saturday. Yes. It's really going to... And so it's almost like an off-air discussion, but I actually my, my, what I want to kind of plant in you is to say the... the Two, three, four hundred people sitting in the auditorium and watching you operate. Start thinking how to teach them. So it's yeah. gonna. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be in your face, eh? So you can say to me, Cameron, please go out to the theatre and go and ask another question. But I think it's such a great opportunity to teach guys, eh? Mm-hmm. I'll be. I'll be actually uh, commenting in French. So uh, I hope you speak French. I uh, do not speak any French. Well, that's, uh, that's it for your questions then. <laughs> okay. Well, boy, thank you so much for your time. Eh? It was such an honor. Really? Yes. Oh. Yes. Thank Guys, you so thank, much. thank you for the, the people around the world who listen to this podcast. It's, um, I love doing it. I love speaking to these inspiring people. And uh, come back again next week for one more episode in season four already. I can't believe wow. it. Eh? Yeah. yeah. It's great work that you do. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you, Cameron. Enjoy the surgery. Yes. Okay. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests. Mm-hmm.